So, good morning. Good morning. If I had to title my message this morning, I would title this message, Victory Has Already Been Won. Amen. Amen. I think a lot of times we forget that, uh, especially as we go through different things in our lives and, and different things, services, that we forget that the victory has already been won. So this morning I want to take just a few minutes of your time to share what I feel like God has had me prepare for you today. Uh, I'm going to cover a, a lot of ground in a short amount of time. So when we look back and, and, and we research the Bible and we read the Bible and we see what happens in the Bible, we, we realize that this was a battle. And we look at this, and we could look at this as uh, like a, a military battle. We could look at this as uh, compared to a game of chess, a very strategic battle. Things that were happening to get us to where we are uh, today and for eternity. And so we find in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, God created all the angels. And we find in Isaiah chapter 14, we find that Lucifer, the angel of light, was cast out of heaven because he exalted or wanted to exalt his throne higher, above, higher than God's. And so the Bible tells us that Lucifer was cast out of heaven and a third of all his angels were cast out of heaven. And then we go further into the Bible, we find that God created the Garden of Eden and God created man and he said man should be created in his own image. And so he breathed life into his soul and he placed man in the Garden of Eden. And the Garden Eden of Eden was created that it would sustain his life for an eternity. And he told man, he said, look, you can have everything in the Garden of Eden except do not eat from the tree of good and evil. Tree of knowledge. And then God said that it's not good for man to be alone. And so he created woman, took a rib out of man and created a woman, and he placed the woman inside the Garden of Eden. And as you look in that chapter, it says, this is the first time it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they should become one flesh. Well, for every move that God made, Satan was looking to counter that move. And so we know the story. Satan used the serpent to convince Eve and Adam to take a bite of the apple from the tree of good and evil. And with that counter move, Satan was able to claim victory in bringing sin to all mankind. On the face of the earth. And then when we go through the Bible, we find that Cain murdered Abel. Started over a sacrifice. And then we find that Adam, God told that, uh, not Adam, Abraham, that he was going to be the father of many nations. And Satan countered that move through Sarah and said, there's no way. Your womb's old. This can't, not going to happen. And she laughed. And God said to Abraham, why is she laughing? Because of unbelief. And it goes on to Hagar and Ishmael. And then God met Moses and sent Moses to Pharaoh to let my people go. And Satan countered that move by using Pharaoh.
Then there was Saul and David. And then there was Daniel who prayed and they overheard him and put him in the lion's den. And God countered that move and saved him. Said, I thought there were um, only three. And the battle continued all the way through the Old Testament. In between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find that there's 400 silent years that you haven't heard anything. And you can say that God was strategically planning what should be next. And, and Satan was wondering what God was going to prepare so that he could counter that move. You know, God used many people in the Old Testament to carry out his plan. And Satan used just as many to counter that plan. I don't think that's any different to today. Satan is using many people to carry out his plan. But God came out of those 400 years and he said, you know, I need a winning strategy. And I'm at living, adding some things here that what I've done in the Old Testament really hasn't worked. And so God's probably sitting around up there with the Trinity and says, you know what, I think, I think here's my next move. I will take care of it myself. And he went down to marry a virgin and she was found with child by the Holy Spirit. And gave birth to Jesus. And so Satan's sitting back going, okay, probably didn't see that one coming. And so he said, what's my next move? And my next move is, you know what? I'll put a decree, I'll use Herod to put a decree that he will kill all the child, male children under two years of age. And that'll put an end to that. And so God's kind of move was to talk to Joseph and have him leave that land. Then you find that Jesus, or John the Baptist, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And as Jesus came up, God said, this is my beloved son, for whom I am well pleased. And then the devil said, boy, hmm, didn't, wasn't able to snuff him out when he was a child. Let me see if I can buy my way with him. And so he took him out into the wilderness, and for 30 days he tempted him. And he said, I'll give you all of this, I'll give you all of that. And Jesus used the word. The devil used the word out of context, but Jesus put it in context and said, hey, it's not going to happen. Amen. And the battle continued. And the strategic plane kept going back and forth. And then Satan's next move was to use Judas who for 30 pieces of silver went against Jesus. And so they crucified Jesus. He died on the cross. And I could just see the Satan just doing his happy dance. He said, I've won. I may have not got him with him when he was a child, but I've got him now. We've succeeded. Me and all the demons from hell have succeeded in snuffing out Jesus. And then God made his last final move. And he resurrected Jesus. Amen. And he sat up in heaven. We established that there was a battle. You know, it's like watching 
a football game that you've seen before. It's like watching a movie that you've seen before. It's like watching a boxing match that you've seen before. Or you know the ending. You know that the, the football team, they're down two touchdowns. But yet, you know the ending. They come back and win. So you're okay with it. So you, you're going to watch this, oh, you get a little excited as you see different plays happen again, even though you've already seen it, right? It's like watching the Miracle on 34th Street. You know at the end, the little girl gets her house, right? She gets her bike, and, but you still watch the whole movie, but you know that you don't have to worry in the movie because she gets her house. You know, in the football game, the football team wins in the end. Even though they were down, they win. Then why, if we know the end, are we worried? Amen. Amen. And you say, oh, I don't worry. Well, I know not in this church. But there are other churches that worry. Right? When something comes up in your life, there's, there's times where you go, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I can do now. Because we worry. We forget we've won the battle. There are no more moves to be made. Amen. The final move was made. Now let's talk about where this battle happens. It says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So where's our, where's our blessings? Our blessings in the heavens. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, for above principalities and powers, and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. So where's Christ? He's in the heavenlies. So we've established that our blessings are in the heavenlies. We've established Christ is in the heavenlies. We've established that he's above the principalities. He's above the powers. He's above, above dominions. He's above every name that is named. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we've established our blessings are in heaven. We established that Christ is in heaven. And we just established, even though we physically sit here, we're in heavenly places. Our spirit Amen. is in heavenly places. Amen. In Ephesians 3, 10, 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to principalities and powers in heavenly places. So we know angels are in heaven. We know that he's established that the wisdom of God might be made by the church to principalities and powers in heavenly places. In Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So we know from this scripture that we have an angel that's assigned to us. Because it says we'll inherit, everybody that's here will inherit salvation. Amen. We have. So, so there is an angel in heaven assigned to us. So we know right now that our blessings are in heaven. Jesus is in heavenly places. We're in heavenly places with them. Amen. The principality, uh, the church and host and all of that's in heaven. In Ephesians 6.12 it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So we know the devil's in the, up there. We know the demons. And, and if we notice in this scripture, they're all plural, right? Principalities, powers. So it's just not one. It's 
It's a multitude. But where are they at? In heavenly places. So if we know everything's in the heavenly places, it seems like everything's happening in the heavenly places. Our blessings are happening in the heavenly places. Satan's attacking you in the heavenly places. You've got Jesus on your behalf with angels protecting you in the heavenly places. Seems like the battle is in the heavenly places. Then why do we continue to try to fight the battle in the physical?
the deception. The devil don't want you to know all of his tricks and, and, and schemes of what he pulls out to try to get you to, to be a, a, a vehicle of his. The devil wants you to keep you in fear and in torment. The devil wants you to believe that he's omnipresent, that he's everywhere at every time, but he's not. That's why if we go back into that, we see principalities and powers and rulers because there's a lot of them that he, they're command, that he has the command to go out there and do his dirty work. God's everywhere at every time, at every moment, at every everything that you could think of. But the devil would like you to believe he's the same. But see, the devil's just an imitation. He's limited on what he can do by what you allow. He operates as a deceiver. He's all about deception. In order for the devil to operate, he must have a willing vehicle to be able to do what he wants to do. What are you talking about? Well, we go back to Adam and Eve. Who was the willing vehicle? The serpent. Who did he pick? The most cunning and craftiest reptile in the garden. He used that to for, and the trickery to get Eve to bite into the apple and then uh, Adam to bite into that. He's got to have a vehicle in order to operate. And I know everybody here says, well, I'm not that vehicle. Mm -mm. I'm all here now. I'm not that. Either. Until you walk out of here and you go, yeah, boy, I don't like them. I don't do this. I didn't care what he said, right? And you give the devil place. What does the Bible say? The little fox will spoil the vine. The little laveth, laveth the whole lump. The devil is not looking to turn everything around instantly. It's a process. It's a chess game. It's a strategy. It's a move here, a move there, and it's a constant move until he gets what he wants. So he starts out small in your mind where you say, well, I, I, you know, I don't like Sister uh, Emily because she looked at me funny. And, and Brother Jim, he walked by me and didn't even say hi. And then, then it just keeps on going. So then you get in the car and you're driving home and you're talking to your, your other half and you say, yeah, did you see Brother Jim? And uh, they said, no. Yeah, he didn't even say hi to me. Really? What was his problem? And we just keep manifesting, right? That little layman just keeps building and building and building. And what's happened? The devil's doing his happy dance. Because the devil's got a vehicle now. And he's starting to move that vehicle. See? And he's moved it into to the husband. And then he's moved it into the wife. God forbid if there's children involved. And it just keeps going. And then, then when they get home... You know, the husband's talking to his buddy John, said, yeah, how was church today? Well, Brother Jim didn't even look at me today. What was his problem? I don't know, I heard he'd been talking about you. Huh? <laughs> right? And the devil just keeps on working, keeps on going, because we've given him permission to use us. When we get into Ephesians, in the sixth chapter, it says in first, uh, where am I at here? That's eleven. So in chapter eleven, it says, "Put on the whole armor of God." that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay? Then we go to verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand 
the in the evil day having all having all done to stand. And then in chapter 14 it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. And so we look at that and our immediate uh, takeaway from that is we got to put out the whole armor of God. But if you notice in those three scriptures, it says what you need to do is just stand. And in the Bible it says stand. When you've done all you can do is just stand. See the salvation of the Lord. So the answer to your battle is stand. That's what your answer is. Don't move. Stay put. Don't go try to do stuff to eat your own way. In Proverbs, I think it says, uh, uh, trust in the Lord and then lean not into your own understanding. Right? Don't, don't go back to me. Don't go back to I. This ain't the team of I. This is the team of Jesus. Right? So it says stand. So what am I telling you? So if you're outside and it's raining... Right? You're under the eave. You've got an umbrella. The rain's coming down. You're not getting wet. But the minute you step outside of that umbrella, the minute you step outside of that eave, that protection, you're ra it's raining. So we have to stand in Christ Jesus. Amen. Stand under his protective covering. He's fought the battle. Remember, he won the battle. So stand. Don't, don't step outside of that realm. It doesn't mean that Satan is not rampant. It doesn't mean that Satan's not doing stuff. That all hell's not coming loose outside of where you're at. But as long as I'm under that umbrella, as long as I'm under that eve, that rain's not hitting me. As long as I'm where I'm supposed to be in Christ Jesus, I'm not affected by the devil. Amen. I'm not giving him place. Amen. So I'm standing there in the full protection of Christ. Well, how, how do I stand outside of that? Well, I, I went over here, what we just talked about, and I said, I start talking about so and so. See, I done stepped out because Christ ain't giving us any instructions to gossip. Christ didn't give us any instructions to, to hate anybody. He says you love everybody. Right? Christ didn't tell us to go uh, make phone calls about somebody. Christ didn't tell us to go steal something. Christ didn't tell us to take something that wasn't ours. Christ didn't, he didn't, the devil did all that. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But if we'll stand under where Christ has us, we don't have to worry about it. The battle's already been won. So, in order for the devil to use you, you have to give him place. You have to give him uh, permission to use you. Is that something that you say, okay, devil, here I am, just come use me? No, no. But knowing right from wrong, knowing what God has for you, and not following God's plan, not staying under his umbrella, not staying under the protection of Christ, allows you to give the devil permission. Yep. In John 3, chapter uh, 13, verse 27, Judas, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Because remember, Judas gave him permission. In Acts chapter 5, uh, in verse 3, Peter said to Ananias, Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart? There's all kind of examples, folks, in the Bible that tell you that Satan has used people. So, let's recap. We know our blessings in heaven. We know Jesus is in heaven. We know we're there with Jesus. Amen. We know the angels are in heaven. We know that the demon, Satan, and all of them are in the heavenly places. 
We know there's some battles up there. We know at the end of the day, Jesus has uh, made the final uh, battle and won through the resurrection Amen. and sits up there. And we know in scripture that he says he's above every name, every principality, every power, everything. We know that we're to stand. And if we'll stand where we're supposed to be, right, staying under Jesus' protective covering, we're going to be okay. Amen. We know that it's not our battle to fight because Christ has already fought. Amen. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, it was completed. There's nothing else that's needed. That scripture tells you it's completed. So in Ephesians chapter 6 again, I believe I'm at verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may with, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, <coughs> against spiritual hosts of wicked, wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having all that, all having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your girded, your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So there's six things in here, and when you break them down, there's two categories. So the first three I just read. The takeaway is saying, have it, already done. So when we look at this, and it says, stand there, having girded your waist with truth, you should already have that. That's not something you're picking up now to use. It says, having your waist girded with truth. You should already have that truth on. You should be wearing it every day. Having the breastplate of righteousness, having, already done. You already have it. And having your uh, having shod your feet with uh, the preparation of the gospel of peace already done. That's something as a child of God you should have on all the time. Amen. All the time. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. These are three other weapons that you're able to pick up and use, depending on what you need. The first three you should already have on. The second three he gives you to use as needed. Amen. God's not dressing you, folks. He gives you, he equips you for everything that you need. Amen. Right? You have that truth, you've shouted your, uh, you have the peace, you have the breastplate, the other tools he's given you, and if you're standing where you ought to be standing, then we should have victory. Amen. So the sword, uh, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Where at? In the Spirit. Being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, the alternate utterness may be given to me that I may be open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel <coughs> for, for which I am an ambassador in the chains that in it I may speak boldly and not to speak. So, the takeaway today is it's a, it's a spiritual battle. We've identified our blessing. We identified what Christ was. We identified where we are. 
We identified there's angels up there, good and bad. We have under, understand that principalities, powers, all that's up there. We also understand that Christ says his name is above every, every other name, and he's above all of that, and they're all subject to him. Right? We understand by his resurrection that he won. It's done. Amen. We understand that if we stay within Christ and we stay where we're supposed to be and we don't become a vehicle for the use by Satan, we're going to be okay. Amen. We understand that we've got some weapons that, uh, that God's given us that we should wear all the time. We've got some other weapons that we could pick up and use as necessary. So I finished just today, you should be living in victory. Amen. Amen. And when that battle comes to you, don't always try to don't, don't always try to be like a doubting Thomas. Amen? Amen. Amen.